the Red Peril. In Moscow that year, thousands marched past a draped coffin in the Red Square. The coffin of the father of the revolution, Lenin. There were many who believed that with the passing of its archpriest, Bolshevism might cease to menace the world's existing society. We all know the answer to that one. In the countries of the world where it had its branches, the Communist Party continued along its path, as it had done since the beginning. In Britain, however, not a little of its redness was suspected to have rubbed off on the members of the Labour Party. For those who didn't comprehend the difference, the two parties seemed one and the same. Though it was hard to compare those respectable, top-hatted cabinet members who drove off to see the king at Windsor with the black-coated, bomb-throwing revolutionaries of the popular press. But be that as it may, a government is judged by its results. And by any government of the period, the unemployment, the distress, the creeping paralysis that held so many thousands in its grip was only to be overcome by the kind of thinking that even the most far-sighted could hardly envisage then. Criticism has been poured on all parties for the lack of drive and effective action during those sad days. But is it not true that mankind only puts its house in order when it is good and ready? At any rate, Mr. McDonald's government didn't seem to have the immediate answers. And so, after only nine months, my friend witnessed again the coming and going at the palace. McDonald's administration went to the country for support in another general election. Support it failed to obtain. And when the votes were counted, once again it was Stanley Baldwin who was to dwell for the nation's services in Downing Street and Checkers. Politics. Aren't they the same just anywhere? Left and right, Republican and Democrat? But my friend discovered one thing about them in Britain. He went to a wedding around that time that of the daughter of socialist Mr. Thomas. And do you know who was a guest along with the family of an alleged red bomb-throwing anarchist? None other than the alleged capitalist grinder of the face of the poor, Mr. Stanley Baldwin and his wife. Well, what do you know? On election evening in London, my friend mingled with the crowds. Election night or varsity boat race night. What excuse does anyone need for a party? Well, there's Sir James Barry celebrating with a cup of tea at a coffee stall. And so they whooped it up in the restaurants, the nightclubs, and the cabarets. And being topical, some of them sang and danced to, Now Ramsey Mack has the sack, it ain't gonna rain no more. Though if the result had been different, they probably would have used someone else's name. But it wasn't the Reds they had to fear. Mm -mm. It was the infiltrating Americans. Tallulah Bankhead. Sophie Tucker. Irving Berlin. London was becoming just an offshoot of Broadway. Look at them. There's a fifth column if you like. That was election night in Britain, 1924. Much the same, I guess, as election night anywhere in the States, whoever wins or loses. But if you want to know more about British democracy, Ask my friend, he's an authority on it. However, there's just one thing he's never been able to figure out clearly. Just what was Stanley Baldwin doing at that wedding? Boy, <laughs> 
on a railroad track, his heart was all a flutter. A big express came running by, peanut butter. 